Hi guys. <clears throat> it is a spectacularly gorgeous, over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization where the little dog and I have been out digging holes all day. I've been pretty much back to the Iron Age. Digging holes. <clears throat> Imagine that as the world collapses around me. Get out there and dig some holes while you still can, but uh, I am just now getting around here to my Sunday sermon, and uh, I want to thank a couple of my alert listeners for sending me this. And uh, you know, I feel like uh, I can swear I already did a Sunday sermon uh, at some point. There's only so many letters in an alphabet. There's 26 that can be arranged. Did not did I not do a Sunday sermon titled "We Are Not the First Civilization to Collapse, but We Probably Will Be the Last"? I'm feeling like that might have been by Umer Haik or uh, Hack. I mean, but anyway, this is Chris Hedges weighing in on this and. Uh, I don't want to overdo Chris here, but since he's he and Umer are the two main people talking about collapse, uh, so I'm not sure if this is just coincidence or this headline, but you will be reading this headline over and over again. Uh, the question is, when will it show up in the mainstream media instead of in the Chris Hedges report? But this is from today, apparently. Chris just came out uh, <clears throat> this one today, and we're going to look at the Cahokia, the Cahokia civilization, and look and try to make some comparisons between that and what's going on in our own on our own planet. I like this. He, he quotes Ronald Wright at length and, of course, Jared Diamond and Joseph Tainter. He touches on all the, the big collapse names. Okay. But we're going to start out in the Cahokia Mounds in Missouri. <clears throat> I am standing atop a 100-foot high temple mound, the largest known earthwork in the Americas built by prehistoric peoples. The temperatures in the high 80s, along with the oppressive humidity, have emptied the park of all but a handful of visitors. My shirt is matted with sweat. I know how you feel, uh, Chris. I don't know if Chris was digging holes or not up on top of that Indian mound. Anyway. <clears throat> I look out from the structure known as Monk's Mound at the flatlands below with smaller mounds dotting the distance. These earthen mounds built at the confluence of the Illinois, Mississippi, and Missouri rivers are all that remain of one of the largest pre-Columbian settlements north of Mexico occupied from around 800 to 1400 A.D. by perhaps as many as 20,000 people, which of course isn't that many people anymore, but it was a big deal uh, back in the year 800. <clears throat> this great city, perhaps the greatest in North America, rose flourished, fell into decline, and was ultimately abandoned. Civilizations die in familiar patterns. They exhaust natural resources. They spawn parasitic elites who plunder and loot the institutions and systems that make a complex society possible. They engage in feudal and self-defeating wars and then the rot sets in. The great urban centers die first, falling into irreversible decay. Central authority unravels. Artistic expression and intellectual inquiry are replaced by a new dark age. 
Yes, can you say Donald Trump? Yes. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I didn't mean to offend. I didn't uh, mean to offend Tigger. Anyway, artistic expression and intellectual inquiry are replaced by a new dark age, the triumph of tawdry spectacle and the celebration of crowd-pleasing imbecility. So, of course, we have to uh, come in with a quote from anthropologist Joseph Tainter from The Collapse of Complex Societies. I need to read that book again. It's been, <clears throat> good Lord, 15 years since I read that book. Anyway, collapse occurs and can only occur in a power vacuum. Collapse is possible only when there is no competitor strong enough to fill the political vacuum of disintegration. Close quote. Yippers. Several centuries ago, the rulers of this vast city complex, which covered some 4,000 acres, including a 40-acre central plaza, stood where I stood. <clears throat> they no doubt saw below in the teeming settlements an unassailable power, with at least 120 temple mounds used as residences, sacred ceremonial sites, tombs, meeting centers, and ball courts. Cahokia warriors dominated a vast territory, from which they extracted tribute to enrich the ruling class of this highly stratified society. Reading the heavens, these mound builders constructed several circular astronomical observatories, wooden versions of Stonehenge. The city's hereditary rulers were venerated in life and death. A half mile from Monk's Mound is the seven-foot-high Mound 72, in which archaeologists found the remains of a man on a platform covered with 20,000 conch-shell disc beads from the Gulf of Mexico. The beads were arranged in the shape of a falcon with the falcon's head beneath and beside the man's head. Its wings and tail were placed underneath the man's arms and legs. Below this layer of shells was the body of another man buried face downward. Around these two men were six more human remains, possibly retainers who may have been put to death to accompany the entombed man in the afterlife. Nearby were buried the remains of 53 girls and women ranging in age from 15 to 30, laid out in rows in two layers separated by matting. They appeared to have been strangled to death. Then uh, Chris figures this is as good a time as any to quote poet Paul Valeri, quote, A civilization has the same fragility as a life. <laughs> I guess that's as good a place as any to put that quote there, uh, Chris. Across the Mississippi River from Monk's Mound, the city skyline of St. Louis is visible. It is hard not to see our own collapse and that of Cahokia. In 1950, St. Louis was the eighth largest city in the United States with a population of 856,796 people. Today, that number has fallen to below 300,000, a drop of some 65%. 
major employers, Anheuser Busch, McDonnell Douglas, TWA, Southwestern Bell, and Ralston Purina, have dramatically reduced their presence or left altogether. St. Saint, Saint Louis is consistently ranked as one of the most dangerous cities in the country. One in five people there live in poverty. The St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department has the highest rate of police killings per capita of the 100 largest police station departments in the nation, according to a 2021 report. Prisoners in the city's squalid jails where 47 people died in custody between 2000 and 2019 complain of water being shut off from their cells for hours and guards routinely pepper spraying inmates, including those on suicide watch. The city's crumbling infrastructure, hundreds of gutted and abandoned buildings, <clears throat> empty factories, vacant warehouses, and impoverished neighborhoods replicate the ruins of other post-industrial American cities, the classic signpost of a civilization in terminal decline. All right, so at least St. Louis is doing something right to save the planet. Uh, good for St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis sounds like the most sustainable city in America, according to that description. I, I cannot imagine a better way to save the planet than to reduce your population from 850,000 to less than 300,000. Anyway, okay, so we've heard from Joseph Tater, so now let's hear from Jared Diamond from, of course, one of the all-time Bibles of the Collapse, <coughs> titled Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. Quote, Just as in the past, countries that are environmentally stressed, overpopulated, or both, become at risk of getting politically stressed and of their governments collapsing. Huh. When people are desperate, undernourished, and without hope, they blame their government. It's the government's fault, which they see as responsible for or unable to solve their problems. They try to emigrate at any cost. They fight each other over land. They kill each other. They start civil wars. They figure that they have nothing to lose, so they become terrorists, or they support or tolerate terrorism, close quote. And of course, I would uh, maybe be mentioning Haiti about now. All right, back to Chris. <clears throat> Pre-industrial civilizations were dependent on the limits of solar energy and constrained by roads and waterways, impediments that were obliterated when fossil fuels became an energy source. As industrial empires became global, their increase in size meant an increase in complexity. Ironically, this complexity makes us more vulnerable to catastrophic collapse, not less. Soaring temperatures, for instance, Iraq is now enduring 120 degree heat that has fried the country's electrical grid. So soaring temperatures, the depletion of natural resources, flooding, droughts, the worst drought in 500 years, is devastating Western, Central, and Southern Europe and is expected to see a decline in crop yields of 8 or 9 percent. Power outages, like the one we had here yesterday, 
power outages, wars, pandemics, a rise in zoonotic diseases and breakdowns in supply chains combine to shake the foundations of industrial society. The Arctic has been heating up four times faster than the global average, resulting in an accelerated melting of the Greenland ice sheet and freakish weather patterns. The Barents Sea north of Norway and Russia are warming up to seven times faster. Climate scientists did not expect this extreme weather until 2050. Okay, so I am glad to uh, see that Chris now uh, shares a long passage from a... Uh, but I have done a Sunday sermon on before from this excellent book by anthropologist Ronald Wright called A Short History of Progress. It's about this thick, takes about an hour to read anybody just starting down the road uh, of figuring out what's going on with the collapse of global industrial civilization. If you're, if you're not quite ready to dive into Joseph Tainter and Jared Diamond, you know, the, the big, you know, the big guns, uh, you know, with the big fat books explaining how all of this works to you, an excellent place just to get, you know, it's like the Cliff Notes version of Tainter and uh, Diamond. Ronald Wright a short history of progress. Don't know how old. How old is that book now? Twenty years. Good lord. He didn't put the date. Anyway, take it away. Ron, anthropologist Ronald Wright to explain this to anyone who's trying to figure out what's going on on the planet. Quote: Each time history repeats itself. The price goes up. Yes, uh, the anthropologist Ronald Wright warns, calling industrial society a suicide machine. I love it. Industrial society is a suicide machine. In a short history of progress, he writes, quote, okay, summing this up, civilization is an experiment a very recent way of life in the human career, and it has a habit of walking into what I am calling progress traps. A small village on good land beside a river is a good idea. But when the village grows into a city and paves over the good land, it becomes a bad idea. While prevention might have been easy, a cure may be impossible. A city is not easily moved, and neither is a planet. This human inability to foresee or to watch out for Long-range consequences may be inherent to our kind, shaped by the millions of years of the millions of years plural when we lived hand to mouth by hunting and gathering. It may also be little more this is civilization he's talking about civilization may also be little more than a mix of inertia, greed, and foolishness encouraged by the shape of the social pyramid, the concentration of power at the top of large-scale societies gives the elite a vested interest in the status quo. They continue to prosper in darkening times long after the environment and general populace begin to suffer. 
I was just making this comment in around when when was it? In the last three days, I was I was making this this very same point. Uh, you know, all of this crap uh, going on with this new climate bill is a perfect example uh, of what Ronald Wright is talking about here. All you got to do. To, to to find out what this anthropologist was writing about 20 years ago is read that new climate legislation. Uh, there it is. It's in your face what, what he's saying here. <clears throat> One more time. For anybody who does not understand the Inflation Reduction Act, we're going to let Ronald Wright and Chris Hedges explain it to you. The concentration of power at the top of large-scale societies gives the elite, can you say, the, these big, you know, these energy executives, a vested interest in the status quo. They continue to prosper in darkening times long after the environment and general populace begin to suffer, they don't care whether it's fossil fuels or green energy. It makes no difference to these scumbags at the top of the pyramid. They don't care about the planet. They don't care about the little people. They care about making their money and keeping themselves in, you know, in power and selling this bright green lie and ramming it down our throats just like they've been doing fossil fuels for the past 150 years. Out with the new boss, and out with the old boss, in with the new. Okay. Wright also reflects upon what will be left behind Okay, Ronald, what will be left behind after this civilization is done and gone? <clears throat> okay, the archaeologists who dig us up will need to wear hazmat suits. Humankind will leave a telltale tell layer in the fossil record composed of everything we produce from mounds of chicken bones, wet wipes, tires. I have a, I have a pile of tires and a, probably a mound of chicken bones sitting out of my yard right now. Uh, okay. You're talking about mound builders. We are the new mound builders. We are building mounds of chicken bones, wet wipes, tires, mattresses and other household waste to metals, concrete, plastics, industrial chemicals, and the nuclear residue of power plants and weaponry. Talking about mound builders, I would say we are the biggest mound builders in the history of humanity, dwarfing any mound that has ever been built. If you're into mound building, uh, Archaeology, I highly suggest, why don't you uh, Google the, I don't know, the Mumbai India Landfill, or the Delhi India Landfill, or the Lagos Nigeria Landfill, if you want to see mound building on steroids. Anyway, back to uh, Ronald Wright. We are cheating our children, handing them tawdry luxuries and addictive gadgets while we take away what is left of the wealth, wonder, and possibility of the pristine earth. Calculations, this is still Ronald Wright, calculations of humanity's footprint suggest we have been an ecological deficit, taking more than Earth's biological systems can withstand for at least 30 years. And as I say, I, I wish Chris had put the damn 
copyright date when these words were written because, you know, I think they were written about 20 years ago. So now we're, you know, we're talking 50 years. Topsoil, you know, when this book was written, topsoil is being lost far faster than nature can replenish it. 30% of arable land has been exhausted since the mid 20th century. We have financed this monstrous debt by colonizing both past and future, drawing energy, chemical fertilizer, and pesticides from the planet's fossil carbon and throwing the consequences onto coming generations of our species and all others. Some of those species have already been bankrupted. They are extinct. Others will follow. Close quote. Thank you, Ronald Wright. Uh, never hurts to hear those words again. Back to Chris Edges. <clears throat> As Cahokia declined, violence dramatically increased. Surrounding towns were burned to the ground. Groups numbering in the hundreds were slaughtered and buried in mass graves. At the end, <clears throat> quote, the enemy killed all people indiscriminately. The intent was not merely prestige, but an early form of ethnic cleansing. Close quote, writes anthropologist Timothy R. Pocatut in ancient Cahokia and the Mississippians. He notes that in one 15th century cemetery in central Illinois, one, you know, right before the you know, this was right before the civilization collapsed, before Honky ever got here. Uh, now you understand, this civilization, the mound builders like the Mayans had already collapsed before Honky got here. So you can't pin this one on Honky. They did it to themselves. No, they had never heard of Honky. Okay? So, uh... You can, you can have all of your debates about what happened to that, all those big-ass animals that used to live here before the Asian invaders got here. Uh, and, uh, but no debate here. Nothing to do with honky. All right. He notes that in one 15th century cemetery in central Illinois, one-third of all the adults had been killed by blows to the head, arrow wounds, or scalping. Many showed evidence of fractures on their arms from vain attempts to fight off their attackers. Uh, anybody who does not understand what Mad Max is going to look like, anybody you know wanting to figure out what uh, Manhattan is going to look like, you know, about the third day that the uh, trucks don't come across the George Washington Bridge to fill up the supermarkets. If you want to look at Manhattan down the road, go back and look at this 15th century cemetery in, in this collapsed society. All right? And you will be looking at Mad Ma at Manhattan. Uh, this is this is you know I, I don't know why this is so easy for me to understand this, but if I try to mention this to anybody, I get a look uh, you know like I was wearing a Donald Trump hat. Okay, back to Chris. Such descent into internecine violence is compounded by a weakened and discredited central authority. In the later stages of Cahokia, the ruling class surrounded themselves with fortified wooden stockades, including a two-mile-long wall 
that enclosed Monk's Mound. Similar fortifications dotted the vast territory that Cahokia controlled, segregating gated communities where the wealthy and powerful, protected by armed guards, sought safety from the increasing lawlessness and hoarded and hoarded dwindling food supplies and resources. Now, Chris does a real good job of, uh, you know, citing his sources. He does not cite that source. Uh, I'm not saying it's not true, but I just get a little bit of feeling that Chris Hedges is kind of uh, taking a little bit of poetic license to prove his thesis. I don't know. It's probably true. But I don't know where Chris gets his, that, that he has such detailed information. Uh, anyway, I know what he's doing. Overcrowding inside these stockades saw the spread of tuberculosis and blastomycosis caused by a soil-borne fungus along with iron deficiency anemia. Infant mortality rates rose and lifespans declined as a result of social disintegration, poor diet, and disease. By the 1400s, Cahokia had been abandoned. Bye-bye, Cahokia. In 1541, when, you know, that honky explorer Hernando de Soto's invading army descended on what is today Missouri looking for gold, nothing but the great mounds remained relics of a forgotten past. So that was 1541. This time, the collapse will be global. It will not be possible as in ancient societies to migrate to new ecosystems rich in natural resources. The steady rise in heat will devastate crop yields and make much of the planet uninhabitable. <clears throat> Climate scientists warn that once temperatures rise by 4 degrees C, the Earth at best will be able to sustain a billion people. The more insurmountable the crisis becomes, the more we, like our prehistoric ancestors, will, treat, will retreat into self-defeating responses, violence, magical thinking, and, of course, which uh, we see here in the Doomisphere, you better believe, denial. The historian Arnold Toynbee, who singled out unchecked militarism as the fatal blow to past empires, argued that civilizations are not murdered, but commit suicide. They fail to adapt to a crisis ensuring their own obliteration. Our civilization's collapse will be unique in size, magnified by the destructive force of our fossil fuel-driven industrial society, but it will replicate the familiar patterns of collapse that toppled civilizations of the past. The difference will be in scale, and this time there will be no exit. Amen, Brother Chris Hedges, once again. Uh, so I highly suggest you get out there and enjoy uh, global industrial civilization and build some mounds while you still can. Uh, I got several mounds, and then my first tomato is coming out of my mound that I built three years ago. I'm going to start getting tomatoes out of my 
mound. What mound are you building, little dog? He said, Bob, I'm building a mound outside of those chip, chipmunk burrows. He's got little mounds all over the yard. Anyway, we're off to, uh, we're off to watch Netflix. What did, uh, how did Chris Hedges, what did he, how did he define Netflix? Now that I'm done talking about the collapse, uh, I really liked, uh, what was your description of Netflix? Okay. Artistic expression and intellectual inquiry are replaced by a new dark age, the triumph of tawdry spectacle and the celebration of crowd-pleasing imbecility. Uh, I highly recommend the new Netflix documentary about the 1999 Woodstock, which some people in this house uh, were attending, apparently. Uh, anybody who wants to see a new dark age with the triumph of tawdry spectacle and the celebration of crowd-pleasing imbecility, I highly suggest the new Netflix documentary on, on Woodstock 1999. Anybody who does not understand what Mad Max uh, is going to look like. Anyway. Drink them if you got them. Bye, guys.